Okay, good evening to everybody. I'm glad to see a full house, more or less. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to Doris for all the efforts she put uh, into organizing uh, this evening. And uh, I hope I uh, managed to uh, uh, fulfill expectations. Um, let me start off with an apology. Um, my talk will probably extend just a little beyond your comfort zone. Uh, I have quite a lot of material to convey to you, so I, I, I'd like uh, to ask you to, to uh, indulge in a little bit of patience because I think the, the ideas and the information that I, that, that I want to convey to you are, are important. And um, with all the modesty, I think what uh, Doris said before is correct, that you're unlikely to hear it in any, any other form. Uh, as you know, probably one of the most withering criticisms that the left wing directs at the right wing is what's your alternative? And up until now, the right wing pro-Zionist hawkish camp has been very remiss in presenting a persuasive uh, alternative paradigm to uh, uh, address the affairs of the nation uh, and therefore it's basically been reduced to criticizing what the left wing uh, proposed without offering us any compelling or convincing alternative. And I'm going to try and address that problem today. What I'm going to suggest will, of course, uh, diverge rather sharply from political correctness, but I think it adheres rather strongly to factual correctness. Um, also, I'm one of these dying breeds who not to admit that they are a great patriot um, and that I believe I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of these, uh, apparently one of the dying breed who are not uh, uh, afraid to admit that they are an Israeli patriot and that uh, I believe in the intrinsic justice and necessity of Zionism and the resurrection of the Jewish uh, political independence. But I don't think this undermines my uh, ability to function as a professional political scientist. In fact, I'm probably one of the few people who believe political science is an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, think, I think my analysis and the conclusions that I draw from it uh, arise from a rigorous uh, application of the principles of international relations and political science to the Israeli Arab conflict. My point of departure is, and in some ways that is probably arbitrary, that I believe that Israel should continue to be the nation state of the Jewish people. Now if you would prepare to forego that point of departure, much of what I say is not valid. But if that is your point of departure, I think everything I say is virtually a necessary conclusion driven by a logical imperative. Because today, conventional wisdom, which basically creates the context for the debate, is completely flawed. And the debate is driven by biased cultural truths rather than sound scientific truths. And the last point before I start the presentation, Please note that basically I will do very little talking on my own. I will be presenting opinions that, uh, expressed mainly by people who today identify with the left wing or with the Democratic Party or the Clinton regime. And all I do is connect the dots. So uh, that's uh, we should start with the presentation. As you can see, Israel's strategic options, what would Sherlock Holmes have said? <laughs> Well, that's, that quote from the sign of the floor basically is the point of departure of my, uh, of my presentation. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So let's start off with identifying the impossible. First of all, within the framework of Israel's security condition, considerations. I think if we had gone to 221 Dean Baker Street and hired Sherlock Holmes to find a solution for us, one of the first interesting uh, bits of evidence that he finds is the following quotation. 
which predicts with chilling accuracy what will happen if Israel adopts the policy that it has adopted. And I should mention that this was a prophecy that was made nearly one third of a century ago. The establishment of such a Palestinian state means the inflow of combat ready Palestinian forces, more than 25,000 men under arms, into Judea and Samaria. Notice the terminology Judea and Samaria, not the West Bank. This force, together with the local youth, will double itself in a short time. And by the way, that's pretty accurate as well, numerically. It will not be short of weapons or other military equipment, and in a short space of time, an infrastructure for waging war will be set up in Judea, Samaria, and the Gaza Strip. Israel will have problems in preserving day-to-day -day security, which will drive the country into war, as it did recently, or undermine the morale of its citizens. In times of war, the frontier of the Palestinian state will constitute an excellent staging point for mobile forces to mount attacks on infrastructure installations vital for Israel's existence, to impede the freedom of action of the Israeli Air Force in the skies over Israel, and to cause bloodshed among the population in areas adjacent to the frontier line. Now, I think this is a pretty accurate prediction of what's happened over the last decade. But I think no more remarkable than the accuracy of the prophecy is the identity of the prophet. Has anyone ever said that? Shimon Peres. Basically warning not to adopt the, the policy that he did adopt and was given a low price. Hmm. The next thing that Sherlock Holmes might come across is the following map which is a map drawn up by the, the, joint, uh, the, joint, uh, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the U.S. military after the 1967 war for President Johnson to designate the areas of crucial uh, importance for Israel's defense. And sometime later it was accompanied by an article written by Eugene Roster who was the chief uh, American diplomat charged with the formulation of uh, Resolution 242, so really knew what the Americans meant when they drafted it. And in this article, he uh, addresses uh, an opinion uh, expressed by two senators, Byrd and Doyle, who seem to assume that somehow or other, some Arab state has a right to claim that anything beyond the Green Line is their territory and the 242 is the this is exactly contrary to its provision and its purpose. There is an important document where, which now has been released. It is useful in interpreting Resolution 242 because it reveals in part what the U.S. government had in mind in pushing the resolution uh, through. And I remind you that Eugene Roster was the person behind the formulation of, the, of 242. Um, it is useful in interpreting Resolution 242 because it reveals in part what the U.S. government had in mind in pushing uh, the resolution through. It is a map of the area showing places of particular security concern to Israel. The map was prepared by the Joint Chiefs of Staff who made a study of Israeli security to advise the President on what the, the security concerns of Israel were. And he, then, he, then he refers to the, the map drawn up by uh, General Wheeler when he was chief, uh, chief of Staff. The study advised that the security of Israel required Israel to receive parts of the territory of the West Bank as essential to its defense. In fact, all the studies of Israeli security problem reached the same conclusion. From the security point of view, Israel must hold the high points in the West Bank and along the Jordan River. And then he says something very important, because I do not know if the G Joint Chiefs of Staff would draw a different map today, but I doubt it very much. And that article was published, well, I don't know if you can see that, in, in the, the same year as the Oslo agreements were assigned. Now, some of you might be wondering, as I am, why this map isn't in the forefront of Israeli, uh, the Israeli political uh, diplomacy drive to confront the current regime and say, no, you can't, because you can't pay lip service to Israeli security and then ask them to implement a, a policy which your generals say is impossible to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, reconcile with Israeli security. 
You can't, you, you can't adopt a policy which your generals say is, uh, is, is undermining Israeli security and then pay lip service to Israeli security. So I'm sure what I'm going to show you on the next few slides is what most people know, but I think it's good to just to refresh our memories. How great is greater Israel that people keep talking about? Well, if we compare it to some of the larger countries in the world, you can see the proportion. And if you compare it with, say, the Muslim world, it would be that size. And even if you look at, and if you look at the, uh, the Arab world, the picture is no less daunting. So one must wonder about the logical construction of a formula for peace where the Arabs are going to give you something they have very little of, i.e. peace, in exchange for something that they have a large amount for, i.e. land. Now, let's have a look at size and security, because when you talk about land, it's not only the question of geographic expanse, it's also the question of topographical structure. So if we look at satellite photographs of Israel, you'll see that, uh, of course, uh, the distances here are very small, nine miles around Tel Aviv, uh, 25 miles to the coast, coast here, much less to the only international airport, as we'll see. But even more important is the topographical structure of the area being designated for the Palestinian state. As you can see, it's a block of mountains overlooking the, the most heavily populated area of Israel with basically insignificant, uh, insignificant distances here. I traveled further from downtown to the lecture than basically you would travel from the border of the Palestinian state to the ocean. Now, what would happen if you actually, if you looked at it in cross-section, you can see this is the slopes down to the coastal plain. This is the Jordan, Jordan Valley, which is probably one of the best world's anti-tank trenches, natural t trenches, and therefore is essential for Israel's defense. But if you stood, say, over here in the area designated for the Palestinian state, what would you see? Well, you'd see one of Israel's largest power stations, just close to Kisaria, an upmarket uh, suburban area. Um, that's what it would look like at sunset. And all these, all, all these visuals that I'm going to show you now, you must remember, this is exactly what any Palestinian intelligence officer would see with a pair of binoculars. If we moved a little south, you would see Ben Gurion Airport. That was the, that's the terminal, and that's the runway. There you can see a plane on the runway, enlarged. And here you have the terminal. People, uh, people who have been to, to, to Ben Gurion Airport know the long corridor you walk down from passport control to the duty free. That's exactly what the Palestinian would see with a pair of binoculars. And of course, the rationale for greater Israel is security, sanctity for the religious, and sanity for everyone. If you look at Tel Aviv, there you have the Israeli towers. And slightly different view, you can see the Diamond Exchange, that's the tallest building in the greater Tel Aviv area. And that's where Hood Barak lives. So you can actually see the home of the Defense Minister with a pair of binoculars from the area designated for the Palestinian state. And those of you who know Tel Aviv, that's the Reading Power Station. And Tel Aviv University is about here. And, sorry, that's an, another, another shot showing where Ehud Barak lives. So uh, anyone who advocates relinquishing this territory to the Palestinians must need a very creative definition of being pro-Israel. So that's more or less what I would direct to J Street. How can you be pro-Israel if you want to really expose 80% of the population and 80% of the, uh, the, the economic activity to such, uh, to such vulnerability? Now, let's have a look at what other people say about this, or said about this. Going back to Shimon Peres, 
Even if the Palestinians agree that their states have no army or weapons, who can guarantee that a Palestinian army would not be mustered later to encamp at the gates of Jerusalem and the approaches to the lowlands? And if a Palestinian state were unarmed, how would it block terrorist acts perpetrated by extremist fundamentalists or irredentists? That's a very good question, of course, and one should press him for an answer, especially since that was a book written the year, published the year that Oslo was signed. And you can see the approaches to the lowlands we saw before. And Paris went on, of course it is doubtful whether territorial expanse can provide absolute deterrence. However, the lack of minimum territorial uh, expanse places a country in a position of absolute uh, lack of deterrence. This in itself constitutes almost compulsive temptation to attack Israel from all directions. In the 20th century, with the development of rapid mobility of armies, the defensive importance of territorial expanse has increased. Please note, the development of modern weaponry does not decrease the importance of territory, it increases it. The increased mobility, firepower and range of modern weaponry means you need more land to survive, you need more land to deploy it, you need more land for maneuvers, not less. In the 20th century, with the development of, uh, of rapid mobility of armies, the defensive importance of territorial expanse has increased. Without a border which affords uh, security, a country is doomed to destruction in war. And just to drive over the point a little more, in 1948 it may have been possible to defend the thin waste of Israel's most densely populated area when the most formidable weapon used by both sides was a cannon of limited mobility and limited firepower. If a Palestinian state is established, it will be armed to the teeth. Within it there will be bases of the most extreme terrorist forces who will be equipped with anti-tank and anti-aircraft shoulder launch rockets, which will endanger not only random passes by, but also every airplane and every helicopter taking off in the skies of Israel and every vehicle traveling along the major traffic routes. And if any of you have been along Highway 6 lately, you know how true that is. And he has an interesting quote. It's interesting because it was made by Amnon Rubinstein. Amnon Rubinstein was a member of Meretz, the far, la far left party in, uh, in Israel, and he became Minister of Education. And in an article in Haaretz a number of years ago, quite a few number of years ago, he argued with the left wing who proposed Palestinian state. The proponents of a Palestinian state claim if they, the Arabs, threaten us with artillery from Kalkilia, we will threaten Kalkilia with our artillery. Kalkilia is a, is, a, is a town very close to the Green Line. Kalkilia is a, is, a is a town very close to the Green Line. However, the answer to this is very simple. The Arab world can exist, prosper and develop, not only if our artillery threatens Kalkilia, but even if it hits it. Israel, small and exposed, will neither be able to exist nor to prosper if its urban centers, its vulnerable airport, which you've seen, and its narrow winding roads are shelled. And there you can see its vulnerable airport with a plane on the runway. This is the fundamental difference between them and us. This is the terrible danger involved in the establishment of a third independent sovereign state between us and the Jordan River. A third state is liable to be an arrowhead directed at the very heart of Israel with all the force of the Arab world behind it. Amnon Rubinstein, minister from the left-wing Meretz party. And even the iconic Igal Alon, in an article in the prestigious uh, foreign Affairs wrote about the importance of territory in the age of modern weaponry. The innovation and sophistication in weaponry, including the appearance of ground-to-ground -ground missiles and supersonic fighter bombers, not only fail to diminish the value of strategic depth and natural barriers, but they in fact enhance their importance. This is even more true for Israel's difficult geographic position. One does not have to be a military expert to easily identify the critical defects of the armistice lines that existed until June the 4th, 1967. For Israel, a military defeat would mean the physical extinction of a large part of its population and the political elimination of the Jewish state. To lose a single war is to lose everything. Yigal Alon, iconic leader of the Labour Party, and expressing 
the huge asymmetry of the conflict. And perhaps just finally, it would be interesting to see what Arik Sharon wrote just before the Oslo Agreements. In an article which was published in Ma'ariv, uh, which was entitled The Imperative Not to Free from Terror, Sharon explained how he managed to overcome the, the terror in the Jordan Valley in the 1970s, the infiltration from Jordan. And he said, these experiences prove not only that terror can be eradicated, but the principle by which this is to be accomplished. It is imperative not to run from terrorism, and it will be smitten only if we control its bases and engage its gangs on their own territory. And Gaza is the prime example. The populated sections of Gaza had in 1960 become an area controlled by the terrorist organizations because the defense minister decided to evacuate the towns. That was Yitzhak Rabin there. The towns, villages, and refugee camps. Fortunately, we returned to the correct policy before the Gaza Strip exploded like a festering abscess, which could have poisoned the entire surroundings. But because of the mistaken policy of fleeing from the population centers and refraining from eliminating the danger in its early formative stages, we had to conduct a much more difficult and lengthy campaign. Now, if we once more fall into the same mistake, the price will be much heavier than before, as it was. Because now the terrorists and the means they have at their disposal are different and more dangerous than before, as of course is true. If we abandon Gaza, it will be taken over by the terror organizations, as it was. Palestinian Square in Gaza will become a launching site for rockets aimed at Ashkelon, as it was. And what will the IDF do then? Will it once again recapture Gaza? Shell and bomb the towns and refugee camps in the Gaza Strip, as it did in Cast Lead. We all aspire to a political settlement, but we will not reach it by way of surrender, only by crushing terrorism, and we can only eliminate terrorism if we control its bases and find its gangs there and destroy them. And that's what Arik Sharon wrote um, just before the Oslo Agreements. Now, what are the elements of Israeli defense doctrine? In the simplified form that it's normally presented, it consists of three elements. Deterrence, early warning, and victory. In Hebrew, it sounds a bit better. But that's very simplistic. Because what do you need for early warning, for your hatra? First of all, you need to collect the intelligence then you need to assess the intelligence. Then you need to draw, hopefully, the correct conclusions from the, the, the uh, intelligence. And then you have to make decisions, hopefully the correct ones. And this is not an instantaneous process. So if we look at the Israeli defense doctrine in a little more elaborate form, that's what it looks like. You have to before you can actually say you have an early warning system, you have to analyze and process all this intelligence. So, if you have a, if there's a surprise attack, you need to block it somewhere. Where are you going to hold up the attack whilst you're gearing for to repulse it? And remember, the the major portion portion of the Israeli uh, fighting force are reservists. Best case scenario, it takes something like 48 hours. To, to, to mobilize them, to get them to the camps, to get them equipped with weapon systems, and to, tra and to transform them from civilians into soldiers. And where are you going to do this? The only place you can really do it is along the highlands of the West Bank, cut by a, a few uh, access roads, which if you hold those physically, you can hold up an attack before it gets to the coastal plain with its huge uh, civilian population. And if, if the enemy reach the, 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 the coastal plain, how are you going to use the air force? 
So I don't want to go into a detailed, a detailed analysis of the military, the military uh, significance of this. If there's question time, we can do that. I just, just want to present the, the, the problematics of it. But the highlands there are essential for holding up any surprise attack on the Eastern Front, which is the longest front that Israel has, and the only front that the Arabs can amass forces for a military strike against its uh, uh, narrow dimensions towards the heavily populated coastal plain, where 80% of the population live and 80% of the economic activity takes place. I know, we'll skip that. Another aspect is water. Water is perhaps one of the most uh, least understood and most overlooked aspects of the conflict. This is a map drawn up in 1991 by an organization called Tahal, which was the, the Israel Water Planning Authority. And you can see these gray areas are areas across the green line which are vital for Israel's water supply. In other words, hydrological activity there, like drilling or pollution, can crucially affect the water, the, 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 the drilling sites west of the Green Line and ruin them permanently. Here's an article written by Ruben Pedatul, the defense correspondent of uh, Haaretz, a very well-known person with left -wing, strong left-wing uh, views. And he once wrote an article raising this problem. Anyone who controls the water sources of the West Bank can quite simply dry out the coastal plain. Control of the two major aquifers, uh, drilling of deep boreholes, and subsequent intensive pumping of the Western Samaria and in the Janine and Tubas areas are liable to leave the Jewish farmers of the Sharon without irrigation waters and the fields of the Jezreel Valley devastated. Uh, it's much, much more serious than that, but uh, just giving you a bird's eye view of, of the problem. And. The head of military intelligence warned the, 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 the Knesset Defense and uh, Foreign Affairs Committee that the Arabs demand 60% of Israel's water. That will be actually be the, the consequence of any peace process based on land, land for peace. And anyone who thinks you can, by the way, anyone who thinks that you can compensate that with desalination sadly doesn't know how to count. Here you can see from a Palestinian site, the wells, Palestinian wells, which if not controlled by Israel, can totally devastate Israel's water supply. And even a small withdrawal will leave that, will, uh, will leave that in, uh, in, uh, in Palestinian control. So, what does territorial withdrawal mean? for Israel, what does the two-state solution mean? It means all of the following will be controlled from the areas relinquished to the Palestinians. Major airfields, civilian and military, including the only international airport. Major seaports and naval bases. Principal power stations. Sweet water system. Crucial communication and transport system, including the Trans-Israel Highway, which will be right on the border. Vital centers of military command and control and centers of civilian uh, government. And 80% of the population and 80% of the economic activity. All of these will be in range of weapons being used today from territory relinquished to the Palestinians. So this is no longer extreme right-wing scaremongers. This is just the empirical precedent. And even if you find this mythical moderate Palestinian who signs an agreement with you in good faith, how can you guarantee his continued incumbency? Regime change is no longer a theoretical possibility. It happened in Gaza. So even if you find someone who will sign an agreement, how can you be sure that he will remain in power? So territorial concessions is a multi-dimensional threat, a long length, because it will make the frontiers much longer. Width will leave you with no strategic depth, as you've seen. The, 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 the border will be right against the eastern suburbs of Greater Tel Aviv. Height, topographical inferiority, as you've seen. And even depth, hydrological dependency, because basically your water supply will depend on the goodwill of the Arabs. And you need a giant leap of faith in Arab altruism to believe that they will sacrifice their hydrological interests for the hydrological interests of the Zionist entity. 
So if we go back to the, 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 the Joint Chiefs of Staff map, we should remember that all the studies of Israeli security problem reached the same conclusion. From the security point of view, Israel must hold the high points in the West Bank and in the areas along the Jordan River. It was about a decade ago, well, before I get to the decade ago, so basically what we have, the retention of defensible borders by Israel implies Palestinian state is untenable. Because if you need enough territory to secure your security, there's nothing left to give the Palestinians. And on the other hand, the establishment of a tenable Palestinian state implies indefensible borders for the state of Israel. And as I said about a decade ago, a rather astute uh, analyst of the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict said the structure of the bargain required uh, the, the structure of the bargain required to be struck between Israel and the Arabs seems inherently irresolvable. For whatever appears to be even minimally adequate for Israel seems to be totally inadequate for the Arabs. So it was quite gratifying to see a, century, uh, a decade later that uh, General uh, Gura Island, who was head of Israel's National Security Council, said almost exactly the same thing. The maximum that any government of Israel will be ready to offer the Palestinians and still survive is much less than the minimum that any Palestinian leader can uh, accept. And that's the impossible impasse.